Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Welcome to you all. My name's Jill Mills, and tonight we'll be talking all about men's stuff. Um, if, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. So if you've got any technical problems, you'll see in the chat box on your screen, there's a 1800 733 416 number you can call. So if you're having any experience, any trouble hearing, call that number and they'll link you through onto a phone line or you can just mention in the chat box if there's anything happening. So we encourage you to use the chat box tonight, ask any questions that you might have, um, chat to each other. If you get distracted, it doesn't matter, you can watch the webinar later. So please get involved if you want to. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so we will send you a link and um, yeah, you can watch it later. So if at any time anything comes up for you and you feel you need to speak to somebody, um, you can call a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14, which is available 24 7. So let's get started. So firstly, I'd like to inter um, introduce the panel. I've got sitting next to me, Phil and David and Peter. So Good welcome evening. to you all and thank you all for coming nice along to tonight. Thank you, Jill. So, we're going to start with Phil and we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. If you've been on one of our webinars before, normally Phil would sit here and present his story, but I'm going to ask him a few questions and I don't know if you want the answers here. Uh, no, I've got <laughs> or you've the got answers. them all, I've they're got all, all the in answers. your head. So we'll move on to um, Phil's first slide, which is um, a lovely picture from your 60th birthday yes. in 2004. Mm. So, um, I guess the first question and talking about research and, you know, genetics and things like that. So when were you first aware of cancer in your family, Phil? Well, it goes back to 1972. I was in my late 20s uh, doing what so many other young guys do or girls do. We're just travelling all over Europe and we're in Athens. And I picked up a letter from my mother who said, your auntie's died of cancer. And it was like, you can't believe the sort of shock that you get and you think, cancer, how, does, how do you get cancer? And But it could have been cancer of anything because cancer is just a big C and there's no cure for it and when you get it, you die. So it was just, just a horrific um, announcement. It was just, uh, that was the first time, 72. Okay, and so after you, because she had bowel cancer? Yeah, she did. I didn't realise that until later on. Oh, okay. But it could have been liver cancer. I wouldn't have you known. Didn't know. But I okay. actually found out later on it was bowel cancer. So then... Having checkups and things like that was that something in your head well, that you needed to do? The, after not that? at that time, no, because you know how do you get a checkup? It wouldn't even know what it was then. But even uh, later on in my fifties, my friends were getting col colonoscopies, and I just thought they were being you know uh, uh, hypochondriacs. And what do you want to get these things for? And of course, you know, being a stupid male, I didn't get it done, and um, so nothing was done at all. Just an idiot male. I mean, so how did you around. end up getting diagnosed? Because you obviously didn't have the, the checkup. The check so no, how did you get no, diagnosed? No, well, uh, I've always been uh, a fitness fanatic, so I've always played tennis two, three times a week, singles, and um, I used to go for, or well, I still do, long, long, long walks. And I was finding that, um, particularly after I turned 60, which I like getting to ahead was over a fair bit of time, I couldn't walk as far. I'd walk halfway up a hill and I couldn't breathe. And I'd be on a court and I'd run from one side to the other and I'd be dizzy. And it was like, and I said to my Something wife, this up. is crazy. I must be just getting old. And she's going to have a checkup, which I did. And the doctor said, he said, look, you're in fantastic condition. Let's just do some blood tests. So I had the blood tests. And on the Friday, he called me the Saturday morning and said, we have a major problem. He said, you're leaking blood. <laughs> so you've got no, nothing in you. So I then organized to see, well, he organized me to see a surgeon, a colorectal surgeon on the Monday. And he said, we've got to go and find out. He said, it could be an ulcer, it could be all kinds of stuff, we just got to go and find out. So I had to have, uh, oh, that was the next day. I had, uh, then I had the endoscopy, colonoscopy, and then I'm lying there and he came around and he said to me, um, well, you can call it a tumour, you can call it an abscess, you can call it anything you like. What we do is we call it cancer. Oh, okay. So I had cancer and he said, you've got it in your colon mm -hmm. and we got to get it out. So then I had 24 hours of, of uh, uh, transfusion, so I had some blood, and then the operation was on Thursday. Mm. It was good fun. <laughs> and so then you went on and had chemo? Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Well, the so. reason yes, the reason I had chemo was because as much as the surgeon was happy that he, he really got it all, they, he said that it did go through the wall a bit. Right. So he said, we really would like you to have precautionary chemo. So 
I had a meeting with the um, oncologist and he said, look, um, we've got a program for you. It'll take at least six, seven months. And he said, we've got this new fantastic drug called uh, Luxaliplatin. And I was one of the first to get it. And so I went through all of that. But as my condition got worse and worse and worse, they actually stopped that in the last couple of sessions. So, um, but I came out of the end of it, so it was good. Mm. So, and again, looking at the research side of things, you you sort of mentioned when we're discussing this um, about the medical research and how it obviously would have helped you well, with these treatments. Or? Yes. Well, the thing is that I looked at when I was going through. Um, well, just to go back a bit, when I was when I'd had the uh, the operation, my wife said to the surgeon, she said it's a miracle the way that you can you can open somebody up and take this this, this cancer out, and he said it's barbaric. He said, it's absolutely barbaric. And he said, it won't be that long before we can actually do it with minor keyhole surgery, all sort of stuff. Then it will become you know, common sense. And he said, you can only get there by research, 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 research. And of course, when I go to the oncologist, and he said, we're researching nonstop all the time because there are different drugs for different cancers. And, and he then uh, he said, it's all to do with the evolution of knowledge and research. Mm. So all of it. So if, if my... My auntie had been around now, she'd still be alive. Mm. Mm. And that I was the I'm hard guessing part. this is your wife. You're sitting that's my wife, there. yes. Yeah. Yep. That's, uh, so that that's 18 taken. months after you chemo. Yeah, on the road back. Yeah. Because it was a pretty long road after the chemo because I had really bad peripheral neuropathy, which I still have. Um, but he just, just get on with it. Yeah. Which you were on our webinar about pain yeah. and talking about mm. dealing with that. So if anyone's interested in Phil's story, how he dealt with his pain, Watch the pain webinar. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of cross promotion there. Oh yes. Yeah. So here are some beautiful photos of you with your family. Well, yeah, that's yeah. a bit of bit of a bit, bit of, of a, some travel photos. Yeah. yeah. Well it was sort of like um, what do you do when you come out of this? You just go and yeah. try and you know seeing one son in Boston and then another son in, in in Rome. It was just all that travel, travel, travel. But it's that's mm. just walking. And that was a challenge of walking. But um, but after after I finished chemo, I became a bit of a guinea pig because I'd had so much of the oxaliplatin, I was prodded and poked and stabbed and this and electric currents and so on because they're just trying to find out what worked. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I've had, I'm having any today, uh, but it's uh, for quite some months after I finished, or even a year or so after I finished, they were still, once again, research, still trying to find out what worked and what they could do and the mm -hmm. damage that was done and so on. And today, of course, with oxaliplatin, the dosage has gone from what I had down to this, when it's mm -hmm. just as effective, I understand. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, um, mm -hmm. and of course, but the other thing I did after the, um, the operation was the surgeon got me involved in promoting uh, men's uh, getting screened because, you know, <coughs> men, terrific. We just don't do it. So we went on TV, we did, you know, Kerry Ann Kenley, we did all the radio, we did press and magazine just to try and get people to just go and get screened. Mm -hmm. And um, so it just... Yep. So you're a bit of an advocate for... Well, I'm a pain in the neck yeah. to his friends yeah, who yeah. don't have... Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, one friend came in, I'm lying in bed, and he said, uh, and I said, have you had a colonoscopy? And he said, no, I haven't. He said, I've got a referral, I'm going to do it next week. Great. A year later, he didn't do it, and he got colon cancer. I didn't yeah. say I told you so, but no. you know, it's yeah. crazy. You know, it's just silly that we don't do it. Yeah, it is. With... yeah I, can I, I butt in there yeah. and sort of talk about the... Uh, the bowel screen program is that yeah. not everyone has to have a colonoscopy. Yeah, sure. But, yeah. Um, fecal alcohol blood test is a, is a really screening yeah. test. It's free, and uh, when you turn 50, you, you, you get you the pack. Get a, get a pack. Oh, I know because I've just had one, and I'm yeah. very, very keen to get it off there and send it in. It's you know, it's a way that you can save your life with a very simple test. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here um, about how many cycles did you have? I don't know. If uh, 12, 12. 12. 12 cycles. And it was, so was, um, it was a week on, a week on, a week off. A week on, I had a, a, a porta calf in my chest, and I'd go in on the Tuesday. I'd have a full day with infusion. Then they'd hook me up to a like a, a baby's bottle, and I'd wear that for 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go back on the Thursday, and they'd just unplug me, and I'd, I'd have a week off mm -hmm. to get over that. Then I'd go back and do it again. But I had a little break in the middle because the oncologist said, I think you need a break, just go away for two weeks. And, yeah. But you can't get on a plane because you've got no, no immune system. So, so mm -hmm. you drive everywhere and stay away from crowds. And this is kind of a, from Bob. Um, any data that Lucrin has benefits beyond six months? 
Yeah, so I think that's a, a question different to Phil's experience in yeah. prostate cancer, and I think it, it, it's very hard to ask to answer that question because it really varies for different people. But okay. for prostate cancer, hormone treatment is a really important part of their treatment, and where the prostate cancer has spread, generally we say people should continue hormone treatment such as Lucrin indefinitely. Um, but for people who've had radiotherapy to cure a prostate cancer, if it's a, a low a risk cancer, then six months of Lucrin is generally enough. But there are higher risk cancers where perhaps two or even three years of Lucrin is better to stop the cancer coming back. But we need to balance that against the side effects. And one thing research has told us is there's big men's issues about hormone treatment for prostate cancer and it can mm. cause tiredness, affect people's mood, affect people's sexual function and libido and all yeah. sorts of things. So that's where research is really guiding us and there's been really good trials telling us how long people should have lucrin in those situations. So it's kind of an individual thing and your oncologist is the one that's going to be guiding exactly. based on research. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so it's interesting, so you put your hand up for research or you kind of got dragged no, into it? No, how did, no, how did all that no, happen? no. Because you, you've been involved in a lot a of lot research. A lot of it, yeah. So and they, they just drag you in. They said, <laughs> can you come in? We'll do, oh, sure. And you just do it because you know. Uh, and they, they tell you quite openly, look, whatever, whatever little bit that they can learn or a lot they can learn from whatever my experience is, doesn't matter how bad it is, it's going to help somebody else down the line. And it's yeah. all to do with knowledge and research and research and research. Because yeah. there's often people, and there might be someone watching tonight that's thinking, you know, I'd like to maybe become involved in research. And is there any advice or comments that you'd like to Well, uh, I've to been give? lucky in that just I've just been invited. You know, I'm working with a group at uh, New South Wales Uni called CIPN chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy research. And um, we meet every six months or so, but they do all, there's about I don't know, 40 of these different researchers, mm -hmm. and all to do with research for, with peripheral neuropathy uh, induced by chemo. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm a, a, what they call me, a consumer advisor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a great title. So I'm, only, I'm only there just to sort of answer questions. I won't obviously I don't do anything. But what these people are achieving, well, I'm learning every six months, seeing that we've got one next to the Swato coming up. The first, the first one I went to, I had no idea what they were talking about. But you learn. You just learn what they're doing. You think, they're amazing, these people. Yeah. And, uh, whether Very they're clever. rats they're researching or whether it's other, it's just extraordinary what they're doing. And yeah. thank God they're doing it. They're saving lives eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Really important job of being a consumer rep on a, on a research project. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 you know, it really is. Because what it... What it it, it entails is you know, learning some of the jargon, but then making sure that that research that's being done is going to translate into real outcomes. Well, what research. they do is they send me a questionnaire that they want to put through yeah. uh, patients and stuff, and so it just makes sense. Well, no, it doesn't, but this would. And mm. so, you, yes, yeah. I do have yep. a bit of feedback. That's very that important. Side, yeah. Yeah. But it is mm. the way that their terminologies, they become very uh, locked into technology, mm. not mm. into the person. So mm. I'm talking, I said, you've got to talk to the patient, you've got to mm. talk to the nurse, you've got to talk to the oncologist, you got to talk to everybody in, in, in sometimes a very, very different way. But initially, you start with the patient. I mean, they're really, really, you know, they're scared. They're really scared at this particular point. What can you teach? Well, how do you, uh, you, want to, you want the answers, but it's the way you actually ask, ask the questions. Yeah. So that's quite valuable. Your, uh, well, yeah, I, yeah what you, I guess. Even though it's a tough thing that you went through, that you can help other people. Well, so. it's, it's the thing yeah. is, it's gone. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a long way past it. Um, yeah. I'm sure I still have peripheral neuropathy, but it doesn't change my life. You know, it's I can still run, I can still walk. You know, but it's it's and, good. And once a week, you look after this little fellow. This is this little guy. He's our first grandson, and we have him at least one day a week. And to make Watson's way, we just walk him down the hill, yes. have his baby chino and stuff. But I mean, you know, without all this research, I, I wouldn't be sitting there with him. Yeah. And that's I mean, it sounds very gruesome, but mm -hmm. the fact is. Research has kept me alive, yeah. and, uh, and and having him is just you know, the joy of your life. Yeah. He looks very cute. Oh, he's magnificent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not that I'm prejudiced, of course. <laughs> and so, um, another question, David W. Just asking, have you made any dietary changes apart from all the exercise that you're doing? Uh, you dietary, do? um, not really, because I actually ate very well before. So um, my wife's a bit fanatical about what we eat and what we don't eat, and you know, minimal fat, no salt, no sugar although she has sugar in her tea, but I don't. Uh, but So it's a really, she got a really good so, diet yeah. base here. So we didn't change it. We just made definitely sure that it was spot yeah. on. But that's all But my oncologist said when I finished. I said, well, what do I do now? He said, I can give you drugs for pain. 
Mm-hmm. But he said, you know, then you can, that can cause other issues. Mm-hmm. So he said, I'd really like you to try and just do it without anything. But he mm-hmm. said, all, I, all I'm going to suggest to you is two things. Mm-hmm. One is uh, exercise. He said, mm-hmm. which you do anyway, so it's no mm-hmm. big deal. And the other one is attitude. Yeah. He said, if you can keep a positive attitude, he said, we know it works. We don't know why it works, mm-hmm. but it works. If you've got a positive attitude, um, it somehow it, it, it makes everything work. So. Good food, positive attitude, Good and exercise. Yeah. And, and positive attitude doesn't mean you don't have to admit if you feel down, if you feel worried. Oh, absolutely if, not. I think you should speak up, but trying to be hopeful and mm, positive yeah. is good as well. I think with exercises, I think you really good example of how exercise is really important after cancer treatment. Yes. But there's also research saying exercise is really important during, during cancer treatment. Yeah, I actually remember telling people having chemotherapy 10 years ago, we'll just rest and sit down for it. Yeah. a week after each chemo and that was actually the worst thing and yeah. researchers told us if you go for a walk 20 minutes every day you'll actually have less tightness and fatigue yeah. and it's, well, I it's walk really valuable through. yeah i, I, think I, it's I, I got to the point where i couldn't walk yeah i could keep falling yeah, over side of but i still went out and walked yeah. as, as long as i could yeah, yeah, they walk yeah. the front gate and back they walk to the corner and back yeah, and you yeah. Actually build it up you're yeah. a very yeah. determined person well I think. you know i was i needed to get back to yeah. um normal as much as i could yeah that was what it's all about and isn't there some new research that's come out about the going for that walk while you're having your chemo, mm. also helping the chemo, maybe certain chemos actually work better? You're exactly. In the early days, I think. Maybe. Early days, I work at the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse in Sydney and we have an exercise clinic. There's similar exercise clinics at other places around Australia. And we actually have our patient come in and do their chemotherapy in the morning and literally go to the gym that afternoon. Yeah. And there's emerging work that, you know, exercise doesn't only help with fatigue, make people feel stronger, but it could even make the treatment more effective. There's also yeah. research looking that doing exercise could prevent particularly bowel cancer yeah. coming back or even breast cancer. We don't really understand why, but I think we will find out that in time and that it's another benefit yeah. to help the cancer. And it's a cost-effective, sustainable way of stopping your cancer coming yeah. back. Maybe. Being here. Yeah. It's actually it's quite strange. fun as well. Yeah. That's right. And it, yeah. I mean, it feeds, the, it feeds the brain as well as the body. So it, it enhances your, 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 um, your mental capacities mm. and your positive attitude by mm. getting out there. And well, I'm still working. So, so it's, it, it's, it's just if you keep on everything working. Yeah. I think yeah. it will help. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Richard is asking what is peripheral neuropathy and it's kind of been answered there on the question, but Richard, I suggest you watch, go to our website and watch the pain webinar and you'll learn all about peripheral neuropathy. Mostly hands and feet. <laughs> yeah, but you'll, you'll learn about that. So I'm going to pass over to David now. I'm going to hand the mouse over. I'll just click through. So David Smith and he's Associate Professor David Smith from Cancer Council in New South Wales. And here's your first slide and here's the mouse. Thanks, Jill. So all in your hand. Okay. Just make, make sure you only click on the slide, otherwise we get I won't problems. click anywhere at first because yeah. I think I'll just give you a brief on who I am and, and what I do. I, I'm a researcher and, I, and I'm with the Cancer Council. I work in the Cancer Research Division. And uh, I'm primarily an epidemiologist and health services researcher. So that really means I, uh, I take the big picture view on, uh, on, on, on health and research. And... Um, and while I've had a, a large focus on prostate cancer in the last 15 or so years, uh, I am interested in other cancers and have done some work uh, uh, in, in other areas as well. So um, because of who I am and what I do, I, I talk a lot about statistics and numbers. And so I'm going to put a few statistics around um, what Phil's talked about, but also tell you a little bit about um, some of the research that's happening in, the, in this space. Uh, and, and I do confess that it has a bit of a prostate cancer focus because that's where I work. But having said that, a lot of the, uh, the issues around prostate cancer uh, um, can be transferable to, to other cancers as well, um, and particularly being aware that, uh, that men face different, different sort of issues after a cancer diagnosis, um, that a bit more focus on this is important. So the, the first statistic that I've really got up there is, is the one that sh- uh, the, the big pictures about 130,000 Australians are diagnosed with cancer every year. Um, it's uh, uh, the numbers are increasing, um, and so so that now a lifetime risk of about one in two Australian men will be told that they've got a cancer. And it doesn't, that doesn't include the very common skin cancers that we uh, that we almost all of us experience. And one in three Australian women will be diagnosed by the age of 85 as well. Now, when we turn that into prevalence figures, so number of people alive today. 
in Australia. Uh, it's around about 900,000 Australians. Are, are living post some sort of diagnosis today. So a little, a little less than half of those are males because uh, men tend to um, have, uh, have a slightly worse survival than, than females. But what you can see from the other side of the slide that um, we've made great progress in terms of the uh, number of people who are surviving after cancer. So in terms of five year survival, which often isn't an adequately long enough time to measure success for many cancers now, but that's increased from about 47% in 1987 to 66% in 2010. So we've made great strides across the board in terms of understanding more about the causes of cancers, uh, how to detect them early, um, how to treat them, uh, and, uh, and, and to improve the survivorship experience as well over that, that period of time. Um, no magic bullets, but lots of incremental and very important uh, components of research have, have all led into that. So, um, uh, just kick it forward. Just need to make sure the mouse is yeah, down. It's at the top My of the My mouse yeah. is slightly Yeah, it's very touchy. So if we look at cancers in men, um, you can see this, this slide really represents the, the most common types of cancers in men, and 25% of all cancers diagnosed are, are prostate cancers, followed by colorectal melanoma and lung cancer. And if you combine all top four cancers, that accounts for about 60% of, of all cancers, those top, those top four. Now, um, as I mentioned, there's been, there's been progress in various issues in, on those cancers, but probably lung cancer is the one that's lung, uh, um, uh, the, the progress for lung cancer has not been as great as for other cancers. Um, we do know that uh, most cancers are tr tobacco attributable. Um, but the prognosis for a, for lung cancer is, is still poor. Uh, treatment options for most lung cancers uh, are still fairly limited, and uh, and that really co co contributes to lung cancer being the most common cause of cancer death uh, in in males uh, and and in females in Australia at the moment. Now we often talk about what can we do and where can the messages be in terms of uh, uh, lessening the burden of cancers, and we know that about 30% of cancers. Are associated with modifiable risk factors, and um, uh, and so understanding those and getting the message out about um, about tobacco and alcohol and uh, sun exposure uh, and um, uh, and diet and exercise are really important, particularly for males um, who often will go through life. I don't know if you described yourself as a, a sort of a, a young naive and um, Inexperienced, but when you heard the words cancer, it's probably the first thing that you, that you, you know, thought that you've ever experienced. And uh, exactly. I think um, uh, arming men at, you know, at a younger age with some of the knowledge that we know about cancer is, is important as we move forward to uh, try and beat the beat it in the future. There's a couple of questions up there. Yeah, you let's can stop see for a question. There. So, um, from Wayne, would you say the survival rate is due to the lack of awareness on male cancers and? Um, are there any particular factors that can improve five-year survival rates for men? So, um, yeah, well, Wayne, um, males do survive a little uh, short. Have their survival is shorter than females for almost for almost, for almost all cancers, and we're not precisely certain about why that is. Um, men are very slightly more likely to be diagnosed with later stage cancers for a number of cancers than females, uh, and and this we think probably relates to the fact that they are less in tune with the, the, uh, the, um, seeing the GP and having those checkups and being diagnosed slightly later. Um, there are probably also issues about seeking treatment and, um, and throughout the disease pathway that put them at higher risk for um, recurrences um, as well as not being plugged into the system that involves regular checkups and monitoring after a diagnosis of cancer as well. So again, little, little, little points along the pathway that are important. Particular factors that improve five-year survival rates for men. Um, well, we always say that prevention is better than cure, and we can still work on some of those thirty percent. I think for males to uh, re continue to reduce the, the risks, as well as being involved with screening programs that are appropriate and age, age appropriate. So we mentioned bowel cancer screening. That's one where we can really lift our game. Only about thirty percent of Australians um, participate in the bowel screening program. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could increase that, uh, we can save thousands of lives from bowel cancer. So yeah. that will improve. And, and, and you know, you talk about prevention before maybe your initial diagnosis, but I think that also needs to be, this is my feeling, 
and more of a focus on prevention and survivorship because that's the area that I'm sort of work, work in. And, you know, the diet and the exercise when you're in the survivorship phase to mm. – so that, that, you know, when you're in this – five year, that, that magic five years, which we've talked about before on the yeah, webinars, that, yeah. you know, we maybe shouldn't have such a focus on that number, but mm. it, it tends to be the way, but... Yeah. 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 Well, we know if we could lift everyone's survival experience to the man, to, to those as men and women who, who experience the best survival, we know there are large differences in survival depending upon where you live. Yeah. Um, so for prostate cancer, for example, is about a 32% high risk of death from prostate cancer if you live in country areas of New South Wales. and um, Precisely why that is, we're not sure, but it's probably a combination of those issues I talked about before. Later diagnosis, falling through the gaps, the treatment gaps as you pass through the through the um, the, the, the survivorship experience as well. So mm -hmm. um, there are a lot yeah. of things that we could do to put men in better tune with what they should be doing. All education. Mm. Yeah. Uh, another comment is that some of the treatments for cancer that stop it coming back can cause problems too and whether that be chemotherapy or hormone therapy that can sometimes cause heart problems um, which can increase the risk of heart attacks and strokes and that sort of thing and again that comes down to making sure people get monitored properly that they get their blood pressure and cholesterol checked what we've said again about diet and exercise and those things as well so sort of secondary yeah. prevention yeah does this this sort of leads into my next slide which again is numbers and epidemiology and this is actually looking at the trends in cancer incidence on the left hand side and mortality on the right hand side by males and females. And, uh, and I guess this slide again shows us that uh, cancer affects more, has a larger burden on males than females in terms of the rates that occur. Uh, and uh, males still die at higher rates than females for cancers across the board. What you can see in the, in the last, does the, uh, the little pointer come up if I do this? In the last um, sort of half a decade or so, the pointer if you, do you be, want the pointer? No, no, it doesn't no. matter. No, people can look at look at the downturn in the incidence for the blue line that's occurring at the top. Now, most of that is uh, is, is a downturn in, in the incidence rates of prostate cancer, but it is also lung cancer um, and bowel cancer. So, in males, uh, for across the board, those 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 are areas where we're making big wins in terms of the incidence. Mortality has been a sustained decline, and and that is just, that's almost almost the three big some of the three biggest cancers as well. Again, prostate cancer, lung cancer, and bowel cancers have been in decline for the last 20 years through a combination of issues relating to early detection and better treatments. Um, for females, the line's a little bit more stable and, and not, as, not as good as males, and that's largely because the, the tobacco attributable cancers uh, are, uh, have, have not plateaued as the same way as they have for men, and um, women uh, still smoke too much. Uh, as do men, but um, we're, we're yet to see the benefit of smoking cessation programs in a lot of women. Yeah. There's also a question coming about funding breast, prostate cancer compared to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a question we can answer. And well, I guess maybe behind that is is, it, is more funding meaning better results maybe? I don't know. Every cancer deserves more funding. Um, the work that's done for breast cancer is is is, is fantastic, and uh, the McGrath Foundation and others put prostate nurses, breast nurses throughout the throughout the country. We'd love to have something similar for prostate cancer, um, but there are many other cancers that are uh, hugely underfunded as well. So some of the cancers that we, you know, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, brain cancers, they need a lot of funding as well. So it's mm -hmm. not. I think we do see research doesn't happen um, for for free, and so research needs funding and the, the funding turns into outcomes. It's worth, <laughs> worth saying that there has been more attention to men's cancers with Movember, which people will be familiar with, which is a charity involving growing a moustache to, to raise funds and not only for anxiety and depression, but for prostate cancer and yeah. testicular cancer as well. And I think that's a, a really good thing. And one thing with prostate cancer, there is a you know, many people who do very well and many survivors. And so there's a group who can help to raise funds as David said some of the other cancers that affect men, such as lung cancer, for, for example, people may not live as long or be as well enough to raise funds. And so there is a move within governments to try to fund some of those sort of forgotten cancers, yeah. whether it be the lung cancer or the pancreas cancer as well. And as David says, they all deserve good research. Mm. Mm. Now, I'm not going to talk about it for long, but can't talk about prostate cancer in the next couple of slides are prostate cancer, but without talking about prostate cancer testing. Um, 
the it's it's one of those areas where there's continued controversy about whether all men should get tested for prostate cancer or not. And the, where we're currently sitting is a far clearer picture in a place than we had been previously, where I think a lot of testing was happening, and and but there was no sort of backing behind that or evidence. 2016. Um, new guidelines were issued for Australia, which were really the first of their kind internationally, but came up with uh, a lot clearer guidance about what we should be doing in terms of testing for prostate cancer. Um, these guidelines state that if you are informed and have a robust discussion with your GP about informed decision making for prostate cancer, and you choose to go down the line of being tested, you should begin at 50, you should probably stop at 69. Um, if you've got a higher risk, which means you've got a family history of prostate cancer, you should start in your 40s, depending upon how strong that family history is. That if your PSA level, your prostate-specific antigen level, the level of, uh, of uh, in your blood is more than three nanograms per milliliter, you should get referred to a specialist. And probably in terms of uh, the most real aspect for men who often get tested and don't know about it for the blood test, but the digital rectal examination, the fingered glove, should be done recommended by specialists, so by urologists, rather than GPs. And part of the trade-off in factoring down the three nanograms per milliliter was uh, was to say we're going to take that out of the hands of the, of the GPs. Now, there's there's still a lot of work to be done around testing, and some of the work that, that my unit is doing is modelling some of the, the implications of testing and stopping and starting at different ages and using different thresholds and cutoffs as well. So the evidence that goes behind these guidelines is massive, but it still doesn't answer all the questions about what we should be doing in relation to testing. Moving forward from testing, because, because we've embraced prostate cancer testing so much as a country, we have some of the highest rates of prostate cancer in the world. And, um, uh, and coming with that, uh, is the issue about how we treat prostate cancer. I think there's been a, uh, well, certainly there was, the, the, this is research that um, we've been running at the Cancer Council now for about 15 years, where we identified a group of 2,000 men with prostate cancer and we followed them and we've been following them. Uh, we've recently been asking them questions and are asking these men questions at 15 years after diagnosis. But at five years after diagnosis, we, we were primarily interested in understanding the disease trajectory but also how quality of life has been affected by different treatment types. I think 20, 20 years ago, we knew a lot of men were getting treated for prostate cancer, but we weren't really sure about what some of the issues were that they were dealing with. And so this, uh, this research, the Prostate Cancer Outcome Study, has really put some numbers around the different treatments for prostate cancer and the possible side effects or the potential side effects that, are, that, that, that men self-report. And the three big issues that men often report, um, and this is a, reporting men, at, men reporting these issues at five years, are incontinence, bowel problems, and impotence. And, uh, and most significantly, I think, is the column that relates to impotence. So men unable to achieve an erection sufficient for intercourse. Um, the most common treatment in this group was radical prostatectomy. About three quarters of men, whether they had had radical prostatectomy or external beam radiotherapy, were reporting. Um, severe and persistent impotence. Peter mentioned before the androgen deprivation therapy, so Luprin, um, androgen deprivation therapy, uh, about 95% of men were experiencing impotence in those particular areas and for that, for that particular treatment as well. So this, was, this has been informa information that's, that's been really useful. It's informed a lot of the way in which we communicate now about the treatment options for prostate cancer because for men with localised prostate disease, there can be options in terms of the treatment that is offered. Do we have some questions there? There are Jill? a couple, and it's um, so David W saying, "Would you stop PSA testing at age 70 if a radical, radical prostatectomy had been has been performed?" Uh, well, the PSA test is used for a couple of reasons. One is to is to is to look at men who haven't had prostate cancer and to see whether they've got prostate abnormalities that might need follow up. So that's sort of the detection screening test. Mm. But for men who've had prostate cancer, PSA is still is is also used as a, a as a, a monitoring tool for marking whether there's any problems or possible recurrence issues. And so I think for that question, uh, if a man's had a radical prostatectomy, you probably wouldn't stop at 70. You'd continue to, to test um, through through lifetime, Peter. 
Yeah, no, I agree with you. And it would depend on the individual person, but initially that would probably be at least every three months because that's someone who has had cancer and there's quite a high risk of it coming back. And then David M underneath is talking about PSA testing as being unreliable um, and controversial. So any comments yeah. on that? Is there something, is there nothing better coming up? So. A lot I don't know of, what your comments are. Well, yes, it, it's PSA test is a very good test to show that there are abnormal, abnormalities in your prostate. But only about one in three, one in four men with an abnormal PSA have got prostate cancer. Um, and so that's part of the reason why it's criticised as being a very poor test. There are a lot of people trying to find a better test, uh, whether it be re refining prostate-specific antigen tests, urinary tests, um, tests of ejaculate. Um, but no one's found anything better yet. Mm. I think the other comment is, you know, PSA testing is now very controversial and as you say, it should be an informed decision with the doctor whether to go ahead. And one of the problems you've said is that an elevated PSA doesn't always mean there is prostate cancer. But the second issue, if you do have prostate cancer, is it something important that could affect how long you will live or is it something unimportant? And, and one of the issues is that people with unimportant prostate cancer may still have quite a significant uh, treatment such as surgery or radiation that can cause long-term problems and we're trying to get smarter to work out which people need treatment. Mm -hmm. Just another aside in terms of research, and this isn't ready for prime time, but we're looking at doing blood tests to try to detect evidence of cancer in the blood and traditionally we've looked for something called circulating tumour cells, so actually finding cancer cells in the bloodstream and then we've got smarter and looking at what we call circulating DNA. So these are the, the fragments that program your cells and there's more evidence in testicular cancer but it's being looked at in other cancers whether we can actually detect cancer in the bloodstream. Okay. I'm going to sit through a couple of things. I'm going to leave robotic surgery alone for the moment as well. Okay. Just talk about two, two trials that have been really important this, this year and this one really still relates to prostate cancer. It's a trial that came out of the UK called the ProTec trial. Very novel, interesting trial. It was set up years ago. Basically, it was trying to answer a couple of questions. One is, is that they were randomising men to receive PSA testing and to not, and to follow them over a long period of time. But secondly, and this is where they've just reported their results, was to randomise uh, men who were diagnosed with prostate cancer as a result of PSA testing into three arms. So these were men who had classically what we call low-risk disease. So it's a disease that um, in, in modern-day terms is the ones that Peter was just referring to with, that really probably don't need to treat so much. So these men were randomised to have active monitoring, so no, treat, no treatment but regular PSA tests and the occasional biopsy to ensure that the disease wasn't starting to move. Surgery or radiotherapy. It's amazing that men actually agreed to be randomised into a treatment group and it could never be done again. So the results of 10 years of follow-up, and with the primary aim of this, this research was to look at deaths in each of these groups. So there are about 550 men in each of these groups, and at the bottom there are the number of deaths at 10 years. So eight men died in the active surveillance group of prostate cancer, five in the prostatectomy group, and four in the radi radiotherapy group. That's at 99, almost a 99% survival over 10 years from prostate cancer in those groups, which really indicates that the survival for men diagnosed with early stage low risk prostate cancer is, is pretty good and at that stage either of the, these three treatment options were, were, were excellent. The advantage of active surveillance or active monitoring is that it doesn't come with the consequences of, uh, of radical treatment um, and, and the risks of uh, urinary incontinence, bowel problems or impotence in that group was, uh, was, was low. Having said that, about 50% of the group on active monitoring did move into one of the other groups and had radical treatment over the 10 years that they were studying. So active monitoring is a very good option to men early stage in the piece to, um, to determine what they want to do. We've talked a little bit about um, what men can do and ex how exercise is important. And here's a nice little study. And we've talked a lot about exercise, both um, before and, and after a cancer diagnosis. Here's a great little study that I've just found this week that um, it's really in the protocol stage at this moment, but it's um, randomising men in Denmark to play football. Um, there are, appear to be a number of advantages in football, soccer. One is that there is uh, the braking and acceleration benefit on 
the muscles and the bone appear to um, uh, um, appear, appear to be particularly benefit for men who might be experiencing bone loss, and um, and so this um, it increases bone leg bone mass. And so this particular study will be waiting to see whether a, a simple um, experiment like getting men to play football, randomising them to 32 weeks of football, has an advantage over mm -hmm. giving them something over the phone, which is basically saying you, you, know, you should be get off the couch a bit more and yeah, hear some guidelines. The last study that I really want to talk about, and this again, this is something that we've done in Australia, it's really the first of its time, was to um, try and understand whether mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, so a type of meditation that's very popular and is practiced uh, across the board in a number of places, uh, had a benefit for men with advanced prostate cancer. Now we chose a group of men with advanced prostate cancer because uh, the, ex the experience and expectation is that these, they are faced with uh, a number of um, psychological consequences and issues about uh, facing uh, a, 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 a potentially deadly, deadly problem. Um, and we followed them for nine months after introducing them to a structured series of techniques that were delivered over the phone about how to practice mindfulness. Now, the men reported that they, who, who stayed within the program of mindfulness, reported that they got some really good benefits out of this. But unfortunately, we didn't find any reduction in overall distress, a reduction in anxiety, or a reduction in cancer-specific distress for the men who practiced mindfulness. Great study to be involved with, and it was somewhat sad that we didn't find a find a benefit for, for something that is practiced widely and, and has a number of supporters. Now, it might be that the group that we're talking about, older men with uh, advanced disease, just, just weren't in tune with, uh, with the, the techniques that they were being taught. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it's an area that we, we still need to understand more about, uh, in particular in this area. So, Jill, I think Thank you, David. that's my bit. Pass the mouth along to Peter. And we'll yeah. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so I'm a, a, a staff specialist in medical oncology. Um, most people will know that a person who treats cancer with a particular um, focus on chemotherapy and hormone treatments, but also in terms of diagnosing and coordinating treatments. I'm based at the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse Cancer Centre Hosp Hospital in Sydney. Um, and Royal Prince Alfred, and also do a clinic in Dubbo, which is a rural uh, city in New South Wales, once a fortnight. And I do a lot of research through what's called the Clinical Trials Centre at the University of Sydney. And through that, I work with a trials group called the Australian New Zealand Urogenital and Prostate Cancer Trials Group. So I've got a particular interest in um, testicular cancer, but also other uh, men's cancers, such as prostate cancer and a number of other um, research areas as well. So I'm actually going to focus on research of men's issues in testicular cancer. I think it's good to hear um, a different perspective. I think David's given a fantastic overview of prostate cancer, so I thought the testicular cancer would balance that, but also in terms of Phil's experience as well. And I think there's a lot of things that apply to men's experience elsewhere. Um, and I think it's particularly good for us to think about how young people deal with cancer and how that might be different. So. Some of the issues faced by male cancer survivors, I think for many people it really is a big change in their life and it's a, a new life. Many men um, don't pay a lot of attention to their health or they feel that they're immortal, that they're never going to run into problems. And as Phil said, it, it can be uh, you know, a huge shock and really can change your perspective on life. Um, thankfully, these days, as David said, our statistics are much better and what that means for people is that they're much more likely to be cured from cancer. But there can be long-term changes in terms of relationships, having treatment and the stress of diagnosis can put a strain on relationships. Um, it can also affect people's sexual function, which obviously has a big impact as well. Um, anxiety and depression I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about and I think that can be an issue both going through treatment but after treatment and again men really need to be open to talking about their feelings I think that can make a huge thing and we talked about having a positive outlook before I think cancer and its treatment can have physical effects whether that's symptoms from cancer whether that's side effects from treatment we also talked about some of the long-term effects on heart disease and so on then there's also a big issue in terms of finances, getting used to taking medications, um, getting used to seeing doctors. 
Um, and I, I see people who, you know, barely seen a doctor six times in their life and suddenly mm -hmm. they're coming every week and it's a huge mm -hmm. amount to process. Mm -hmm. um, just comparing survivors of testicular cancer to more common cancers, almost all men with testicular cancer are cured. I think that's a fantastic thing. That's partly because it can sometimes be detected early um, and doesn't come back. But these days, even if it does come back, chemotherapy is so effective that you know over 90% of people are cured, which is wonderful. There is an issue with that is that because these are younger men, tend to be aged between 20 and 40, they will live as a cancer survivor, you know, potentially for 50 or 60 years. And that, that has a big impact. Um, these young men are generally fit to get through the physical side effects of treatment. They can bounce back from very intensive treatment they do have less life experience and less support to cope with the mental strain of treatment. They may not have a stable relationship. They may not have peers who have experienced cancer or other serious illness in the past. Also, testicular cancer can really get in the way of people who are at a key life stage. They may be planning um, study or at university. They may be starting their career and taking six months off can be a huge impact. They may be looking for a partner. Um, they may be trying to start a family and being on treatment will affect your ability. There may be long-term effects in terms of fertility. And, and there are potentially direct effects both on sexuality and fertility I'll talk about. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about a really important research study that has been done um, for testicular cancer survivors across Australia. And this was done through the University of Sydney. Um, with um, a number of what we call cooperative trials groups, which is groups of doctors, nurses, um, researchers who are really interested in finding out what's important to people with cancer. Um, and this was a survey of 250 survivors of testicular cancer. I think it's come up with some really interesting results applicable not only to testicular cancer but other cancers. So one of the things we found is that testicular cancer survivors do suffer from psychological distress and impaired quality of life. If you um, look on average at their scores, there's slightly more anxiety and depression than the normal population, but there's actually one in five people who have moderate or severe anxiety or depression, and that's different to the one in 10 in the normal population. So these are a, a group of people who, who do have ongoing mental health issues. Thankfully, there was little difference in their physical aspects of quality of life. People bounce back. They're able to, you know, do their normal day-to-day -day things because they were so fit and strong at the start. Um, one issue was job problems. Perhaps, the, as I said, the job had affected their career and study. Mo the most problematic issues that they talked about were non-physical, a big one being what we call fear of recurrence. And one in three people were really, you know, literally quite petrified that the cancer would come back. And I think that's common to many men with cancer. And even when there's a high rate of cure, it's something that's a very natural thing to do. I think in my experience, most men in time manage to deal with that. And over time, they do get less anxious. But I think we can do a bit better helping men with that fear and also getting them to verbalise it. I think a third of people are also uncertain about the future. This has been a big life change. They don't know if they're going to be around. It talked about disruption to family life, ability to have children, and men with testicular cancer generally are um, at a stage where they want to have a family and their treatments may affect that. Um, people felt less masculine. There were body image problems. That's partly because generally a testicle will be removed, um, but also just in terms of their whole idea of being a man, that could be quite affected. And I think it's very relevant not only to prostate cancer, but many other cancers yeah. that many experience. Yeah. Um, also, a quarter of people had reduced sexual interest or reduced sexual activity. Um, again, that can sometimes be a direct effect of the treatment, but I think there's big psychological effects and body image effects as well. Um, of the people, some people have an implant to replace a testicle, and one in five were not satisfied with that as well. So there's things we need to do better. Um, these are some examples of what some younger men who'd gone through treatment for testicular cancer said. One said, you just feel anything could happen at any time. You always feel like you are not prepared to take any more stress at all. Um, another young man said, I'd deliberately not go out. I'd deliberately not answer my phone. I was not in the mood to be sociable, and I'm normally the opposite to that. Um, some older man, one man said, oh, my role in the family has been the looker after others whether that be the partner or children or other family members.
but I'm now not able to do the things that they expect me to do. Um, another said, I f if I feel any little bit of pain in my abdomen or lower body, I immediately panic and think that something's wrong. It's just in my mind all the time that it's going to come back. So that's what I was talking about, fear of recurrence. Um, these, there were some things that were good. We talk about met needs and unmet needs. So, you know, what things do people feel have done well? And thankfully, I think we've got a fantastic health system in Australia. People gave big ticks for mostly generally that I feel I'm managing my health together with the medical team. So a sense of shared care, that they're getting the very best medical team, that they know that their doctors talk and coordinate my care. And that can be a big frustration communication. Um, and also most felt that there were local healthcare services available when I required them. So at least we're getting the basics right, which is good. And our Australian system is wonderful. There were a number of unmet needs, however, a big one be, being that people needed help to reduce stress in life, um, needed help to address problems with sex life. And this is partly because they don't feel um, that they get asked or they're not sure who to ask or what questions to get. They need help about financial support and government benefits. Um, help managing concerns about the cancer coming back. We've talked about help getting life and travel insurance and a cancer diagnosis can make it hard to get travel insurance or life insurance. Um, needing help with others, not acknowledging the impact that cancer has had on their life. And, you know, on the one hand, I think having a positive attitude is really important, but I think there also need to be people available to support them with that change. One, I don't think we're ever going to fix, they need more accessible hospital parking. Is that still a problem, Phil, as a specialist? Yeah. <laughs> and expensive. <laughs> and expensive. <laughs> Particularly when you're going for two days in a row. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that, that, that's just a basic but frustrating thing. They need to talk to others who have experienced cancer, deal with expectations of being a cancer survivor and having emotional support. Yeah. Can, um, I, can I add a lot of those issues that you've marked up there are things that Cancer Council... We, we work on trying to advocate the government, you know, to work out this parking problem and, you know, we have financial assistance and legal help and all sorts of different things. So, yeah. I think it's but, really important. Yeah. It's so important. we try and meet those gaps. Yeah. 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 So um, let's imagine John, a 28-year-old testicular cancer survivor, says, I really need some help, but I don't have time to see a psychologist. And if I do, my friends will, will think I'm a wimp. Yeah. So, Phil, we actually went to our consumers in our research group and said, well, what can we do for these men? They don't have time to see a psychologist. They're working full time. They don't really want to see one anyway. And we've actually come up with this online psychological intervention for testicular cancer survivors. We've got a team of consumers and other experts around Australia. It's based on a program called My Road Ahead, which is a similar program for people with prostate yeah. cancer. Yeah. Um, and it aims to equip testicular cancer survivors with tools and strategies to overcome challenges and using this sort of toolbox approach, how to challenge unhelpful thoughts, therapeutic writing, assertiveness, um, identifying unwelcome thoughts and so on. Um, you won't be able perhaps to see all the detail here, but it, we've really gone, tried to go through this online program that allows people to log on once a week, spend an hour a week for 10 weeks, and go through some of the real key issues for testicular cancer survivors. We talk to them about some of the foundations, about what our program involves, thinking about thoughts and feelings and how to challenge that, challenging unhelpful thoughts, trying to actually accept the way you think and, and sort of move on with that. Thinking about issues after treatment, about emotions, how to deal with anxiety, fear and recurrence and depression, living with difficult thoughts, thinking about some of the physical changes that may affect with treatment, whether it be surgery or, or chemotherapy or radiation, how to cope with side effects and relaxation. Um, there's other things about being a man, and I talked about body image and sexuality being really important, um, dealing with significant others, and then that real positive things about moving forward as well. Um, it's tailored according to people's particular concerns, um, whether they have particular physical symptoms, are they in a relationship, yes or not, yes or no, and that will affect what they need. But I think one of the really good things that gives interactive exercises is downloadable information, audio and activity sheets so people can take things away. But also one thing that people who've been involved in the program said was really valuable was actually having survivor videos facilitating engagement and social 
um, comparison. And I talked before mm. about how men want to talk to other people who've experienced cancer. And we've had absolutely wonderful men, in consumers who've actually been generous enough to be involved in our research and has been given some really honest information about very personal things like sexuality and body images as well as physical effects and how they've coped and that's got some really good feedback. Um, there's also feedback on progress. Hopefully you're going to get less anxious and depressed over the 10 weeks of the treatment. And this is an example of what I was saying. It's really good to hear it from a person who's gone through treatment. So the video content was really good. Um, they also found it convenient and confidential. You can do it online. Um, so we're doing refinements to update the content, um, testing a group of survivors who actually have anxiety and depression and trying to make it more widely available. Um, so I might actually finish at that point, Jill. I know we're okay. getting close to time. Yeah, that's all right. And we can go a few minutes over if Good. everyone wants to hang on. So, Good. yeah, if, if there's any bits you rush through that you want to yeah, no, that's all talk right. about. Um, so, and that, because I was sort of busy typing things, so that program you were just explaining is available for people now or you're still sort of in that research phase? So we're still or? in the research phase, so we're going to do a pilot study now. We've invited people from six hospitals around Australia, testicular cancer survivors who do have anxiety or depression actually to try our refined website and give us some more feedback. Mm. And then once that's actually available, we'd like to make it widely available. Um, the Cancer Council have actually been very generous in funding some of our work to date, and we hope a group like the Cancer Council will be able to host it on their website. Yeah. And, and because it's specifically tailored for, for um, testicular cancer. Yeah. So, yeah. It, so, any plans to, because there's a lot of those issues that are quite general for other cancers yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. To, so, I think that would be the next step. I think you really do need to tailor things. Um, a man with prostate cancer or bowel cancer or testicular yeah, cancer, there will be things in common, but there will be things different as yeah. well. Also a young girl versus an older person. But I think these what we call tailored interventions based on what people need. Yeah, really looks like a, a great resource. Yeah. yeah. Really Can I just add to that, Peter? I've, after I'd finished uh, all my treatments, the, uh, the hospital asked me if I would just have a coffee with this person who's going through uh, chemo. Because they, they get so scared yeah. and worried. So I'd, I'd meet with them and have a coffee and we'd chat on a number of occasions. And we, or, or even just a phone call. Yeah. It's amazing that after talking to someone who they can see has survived, yeah. well, so far survived, yeah. that they, it seems to make them stronger and it gives them, like, okay, I can do this. And yeah. I said, oh, that's why I always say that you can do it. Absolutely yeah. you can do it. Yeah. They all didn't, but I mean, essentially, if it, if it gave them a better quality of life, yeah. that, that yeah. mentoring is very important. Yeah. To have some hope. And Julie, is the, is the Cancer Council, through the phone support, is their ability to talk to other people who've had experience of So we have a program called well. Connect, which is peer-to-peer -peer support that's been going for many years. Mm. So it's exactly that. And whether you, it's often people have just been diagnosed and they'll mm. be connected up with someone maybe in a similar situation, you know, maybe you've got breast cancer and you've got two little kids and we'll try and match you with a woman that's went through the same thing and had two little kids so mm. and you have a certain number of, of phone calls mm. and then if bigger issues come up they sometimes get referred for counselling and things like that yeah. so yeah that's that's a program we already have. It's interesting men will often say at the end of treatment oh I wish I'd had all this and, and they start to read information or, or yeah. talk to people and they say I really wish I'd had all this at the start. But, yeah. but I actually find at the start there's so much to take on that it, you can't That's do right. a 10-week, one-hour-a-week right. website program where you can't read 17 <laughs> books. But talking no. to someone can it's be really thing. valuable. Exactly, yeah. I was yeah. given a big folder like that from the Cancer Council. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I, can't, I can't do it. Yeah. But just yeah. Yeah. talking to yeah, somebody, just yeah. It yeah. Just, just chatting it made a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that as, as blokes we're not as good at doing Absolutely. that talking yeah. Yeah. as women. And, and so making that easier and getting language that works yeah. and putting people in touch with somebody who you feel comfortable talking with. I don't think we like the word support necessarily. No. Either, no. So yeah. finding other, other another lexicon uh, to talk about. Exactly. Chat. Yeah, have a chat. And, you know, that's one of the reasons we even do these webinars is yeah. because it's online. People can watch it when they want, get what they want mm. from it, whatever. There's actually evidence <laughs> that men seem to work better when they're, not not sitting down and talking to each other, but, you know, I'm a cyclist and I love cycling with my friend beside me. We're looking ahead or going for a walk 
or doing doing a task together or going fishing or something. And there's, there's something about how men relate to other men. T- a task orientated yes. yeah. um, scenario exactly. rather than a exactly. sitting, one talking, one. talking yeah. to and looking. Yeah. 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 I find, like I've got two sons and as they were growing up, going through the teenage years, drive, driving them places, then they'd sit and talk. Yes. You know, you're not looking. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so questions, let's quickly, um, we're going a little bit over time. So the first one there, which I'm sure you can all see, um, who wants to answer that one? I normally read them all out, but they're quite long Oh, yeah, ones, I, so. I think I was going to take this one. Um, so the question is about whether PS, with a, a decrease in, in prostate-specific antigen testing has, um, has increased the number of men or the proportion of men who are diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer. Now, there was a, there was a paper that came out in the States earlier this year that was quite alarmist and said that the in, in, an increase of 91% of men with metastatic disease as a result of the US Preventative Services Task Force that said men shouldn't get tested for prostate cancer in the States. Now, that was misleading because all they quoted there was the numbers, the numbers of advanced prostate cancer increasing because the ageing of the population. But in fact, the rates have been stable. Now, there's been a downturn in testing in Australia as well. It started in about 2008. We haven't seen any downturn, any sort of any upturn in metastatic disease. If, if there is, we probably, it's probably too early to see whether there really is an upturn. We obviously need to be careful about this. And I, but I think we've always recognised that we need, to, we need to screen smarter and not harder for prostate cancer and then manage men appropriately who we diagnose with. So we haven't seen any increase yet, um, but we, we monitor it. Okay. So the next question, which is about, as I said, the predictability about the course of prostate cancer. Yeah. Who wanted to take that one? It was a bit of a tricky one, I think. Yeah, so I, it's not quite the right form to give all the details for exactly every specific situation, but certainly those things mentioned on the slide are important. So, for example, if someone has had surgery for prostate cancer, we look at what's called the Gleason score, which gives us a sense of how quickly the cancer may be growing or the likelihood of it coming back. Similarly, how high the PSA is will give a sense of the likelihood of it coming back or if it's growing into the nerves and, and so on. I think there has been some changes recently and the Gleason score has been replaced by a new um, international pathology score, which really emphasises that people, some experts in the audience may know something called a Gleason 6 prostate cancer, which is the least aggressive cancer. And that's actually been given now a score of 1 to emphasise that people with a very low-grade cancer, often it can be simply monitored, does not need immediate treatment. There's, it's quite unlikely to spread or become life-threatening. And then the Gleason, what's called a 3 plus 4 is a 2, and a 4 plus 3 is a 3, and, and up it goes up from a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I think that's actually a useful way to change things um, to get a, a simple score out of 5. And a 1 out of 5 actually sounds much more reassuring than a 6 out of 10. Mm. So things are mm. changing. Mm. We might just skip the third question and go to that at the end. And this last question, I'm not sure, did anyone? Well, there are a couple of more questions problems. I noticed that are really about dealing with um, androgen deprivation therapy and chemotherapy as well. It sort of says genitourinary cancers certainly bring their own problems mm. um, because of the the organs that they that they affect and the treatment that relates to those. I think some of the longer term, the longer term treatments can often be ones that we talked about, you know, urinary problems, sexual problems, and bowel problems, and and the ones that Peter referred to as well that relate to hormone treatment that mm. can can affect fatigue and you know, changes in the body and um, and uh, those sorts, sorts of things as well. Mm. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Um, Steve C in the chat room has made a comment that one of the hardest things to deal with the man with prostate cancer that spread is dealing with the fact that the treatment, such as hormone treatment, will go on forever. And we were actually had, mm. at our research meeting um, at the Lifehouse Cancer Hospital today talking about a, a different situation where people who need to have just chemotherapy for three months or perhaps six months and it's all done, people can actually cope with that and they may be sick for that time. But someone who needs to go on a treatment for a much longer term, it may be less intensive than chemotherapy, but something like hormone treatment, dealing it on a very long term can actually be much harder. And when you ask people how much benefit is needed, often the long term treatment with less side effects will need a bigger benefit to justify its side effects than a short, very intensive treatment. 
So mm. I think it is wonderful something like prostate cancer that hormone treatment can be so effective with less side effects and chemotherapy. But I think we need to get better at helping people to manage to deal with that. And some of the things we were mm. talking about earlier about doing regular exercise, about monitoring for anxiety and depression, attending to good diet, all those things can actually make a big difference. Yeah. Um, and I think you often hear the comments and talking about sexuality and all these issues. And sometimes patients may not feel like, you know, they're sitting in front of their oncologist that it's appropriate to bring those mm. things up and or there's not enough time because, you know, they're very busy and mm. all those kinds of things. Do you have any comment or advice about how yeah. how to, how they from the patient perspective they could deal with that? I, I think there's a, a couple of things. I think, um, you know, one is doctors really should ask about all the things that are important yeah. to patients. But what if they patients. don't? And, and if they don't, it's... Patients, if they can feel more empowered to ask, and it might be something simply as simple as writing down the list of the five most important things you want to do yeah. with the consultation. You can be stuck talking about the PSA yeah. for 15 minutes and run out of time. So just saying at the start, these are the things so I want plan. to talk. A plan, plan a consultation, plan. but also talking to other people as well, whether it be a prostate nurse or, or other um, people in the um, cancer centre or talking to the general practitioner. Yeah. as well, seeing a sexual therapist, all those sort of things can help. And then I think also, particularly with sexuality, if treatments that can cause impotence um, or loss of erections, remembering that's not all there is to sex yeah. and that, you know, physical contact and having a partner and support and all those things are really important as well. So sometimes reframing your expectation about sexuality. Definitely. Okay, and the key messages about men's health, which we were talking before. David, go for it. What well, are they? Um, <laughs> well, prevention is better than cure, and and it's it's not just cancers, but almost across the board, healthy messages that relate to, um, firstly, you know, smoking. The, the risk factors we know about smoking and alcohol, and and getting enough exercise, um, uh, losing some weight, being sun smart are all very important preventative issues but they probably also follow through into the post-diagnosis period as well. So I think there's yeah. been some, some plenty of work that's shown that if you, if you quit all the bad things and that enjoy life in moderation, you're going to live a, a happy and mm -hmm. a healthy and a longer life. Mm -hmm. um, and just aiming at the next, like your grandson, Oliver, you know, the next generation's coming up. You know, are they going to be better equipped? Are they going to go and get their early diet? You know, I certainly it's, will. A, it's a million-dollar question, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but... It's, yeah. it's still a challenge for us, yeah. I think, as as a, as an organ a health organisation working within the larger frame to um, to to be able to make that um, accessible um, financially and um, physically and and everything else that uh, the people feel plugged in and men in particular feel plugged into the system mm. that they feel that they they're part of. Yeah, it's not an easy answer. No, it's not it. an easy one. So we'll flick on to the last slide if someone wants to just click on the last one, which is just our. Finishing one where, so we've gone a little bit over time, um, the last slide. So at Cancer Council, we have the information and support line, 13, 11, 20. Ring them if you've got any questions. They can link you up to other resources and people that um, may help be able to help you and answer your questions. We've also got a brand new online community, which is forums and blogs and, and support groups or groups. <laughs> um, as you see there, Community Cancer Council, if you just Google that, you'll get in there. And if you get stuck, you can ring 30, 11, 20 and they can help you. But it's a great new place to go online and um, link up with other people and have those chats. If it's not in person, you can have them online with other people that have been through or going through what you're going through. Um, and again, Lifeline 13, 11, 14, if you feel you need to speak to anybody tonight. Um, Big thank you to the panel. Thank you all for coming along tonight. And I think there's been some really valuable information shared so. by all of you. So thank you very much. There is a quick exit survey. Would really appreciate it if you um, could do it. Just a few questions, not many. Take about two minutes and um, just helps us inform for future webinars. So this is our last webinar for the year. So we'll be getting ready for next year to come up with some um, some new subjects for you in the survivorship world. So thank you very much and um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we'll see you next year. Thank you all. Thanks, Jill.